I know a lot of, I, I recognize a lot of the names here in the chat. And a lot of you have been customers for a long time. And if, for some of you that know me, uh, but for a lot of those who don't, public safety drone applications has probably been one of the main things that has really kept me interested in this industry for years. From getting emails that, hey, that equipment that you sold us saved lives last night in the Houston floods to search and rescue teams sending me messages that they've found lost people and all, all the different reports that I get from people that are in public safety that have used products and equipment that we've sold to really make a difference out there in the communities. That is kind of the thing that really gets me going every day. So I uh, appreciate all of you that are out there who have been customers. The sound is cutting in and out. Um, I don't know if that's the webinar, but everything looks good on here. Is anyone else having a problem with audio? Is, am I sounding okay so far? Okay, we'll, we'll do what we can, Luis. And so there's my background. I'm with Multicopter Warehouse. I'm the vice president and I head up the enterprise sales department. So if there's anything that you need from a product's point of view, you can contact me or any of my guys that are over here. So let's kind of get to it. Uh, why do you need drones in public safety and how do you get started? So we're going to cover you know, what some different people are doing, how they're using uh, drones for their applications and things to consider as you kind of move forward in trying to build a program of your own. So from 2015 to 18, number of public safety agencies using drones grew by 514%. I don't have data for 2019, but it's a pretty safe bet that it went up significantly in 2019. And I can only imagine how much that growth is going to be in 2020 and beyond. It is definitely on the forefront when it comes to public safety and the things that you can do with different UAV equipment that's out there. Okay, good. So far, so good out there. So why are agencies turning to drones? Well, the immediate intel provide incident commanders with detailed information of remote operations. You can have informed responses, increasing your efficiency by allowing effective resource management, enhanced safety. You're keeping ground teams safe by scouting the area with a drone, doing reconnaissance after the fact, being able to use certain tools like thermal imaging to find a suspect or a victim and really changing the landscape of how different aspects of public safety work. And when I talk about public safety, I'm inclusive of police departments, fire departments, and search and rescue teams. So those kind of, when I think public safety, I think those three things. So scouting and situation overwatch, uh, you're really in the firefighting and law enforcement, you're trying to find and locate people who would be under search and rescue and sometimes under uh, firefighting, depending on how that's laid out there. And how do you measure that? Everyone wants to know is, was the program successful? And the way you're gonna get that is your input from incident commanders and the, the people on the ground too, is like, was that effective? Did it help? What things should you be measuring for success? You know, your time savings, how much quicker are you finding somebody or how more often are you finding somebody or what are some of the tools that are being deployed that are helping in different situations to reduce your risk exposure to responders, which is a big, big thing right now. How can you get a message to people who are congregating that they need to disperse? Well, you can fly a drone in with a loudspeaker and be able to say, hey, disperse. You're not supposed to be here right now. Things that you wouldn't want a human to walk into the situation and do 
especially right now as we're all trying to distance ourselves from each other, which is probably a good reason why we're all on a webinar today. So there's there's definitely that. All right. What are the kind of the different aspects, the ones I've already mentioned, law enforcement, firefighting, search and rescue. There's also disaster response and maritime surveillance. Those are kind of the biggies. You know, I am going to unplug my phone right now because it keeps ringing and it is driving me nuts. There we go. Keep my office a little quieter in here. Don't know if you guys were hearing that, but it was driving me insane. So firefighting, you're going to be, uh, for those people, you're looking at building structures, your fires, seeing where to deploy people properly. If you've got thermal imaging, you can see where the hot spots are and better be able to deploy people. Law enforcement can be used for accident investigation, for, uh, like I mentioned, crowd dispersal, for getting uh, kind of a, a bird's eye view of a situation, maybe tracking a suspect, all kinds of different things under law enforcement. Search and rescue, that's kind of obvious. You, you're, you're trying to find people. Not often are we trying to rescue them with the drone. They're not quite big enough yet, but often the search and rescue teams are taking out and dropping medical supplies or a radio or something to get to that person while the, you know, while the teams are out there trying to find them. And of course, disaster response, being able to scout an area, uh, be able to map ingress and egress routes, things like that that can really help movement within a disaster area. So there's a lot of different applications when it comes to public safety, but I certainly am a lot more familiar with a couple of them because that's what you guys have done. So <clears throat> as I said, with search and rescue, one of my favorite things is delivery of emergency supplies and rescue equipment or a tow line or a lead line. This photo was actually from the Houston floods uh, a while back when they they got hit and the equipment that we sold those people, the fire departments out there were, were used to do this exact thing. This was one of the units that we sold and they were able to take lead lines out to people. They were able to drop emergency supplies and um, they, they definitely credited the UAVs with saving 12 lives that night. So very impressive, very moving stories that are out there of successes that people have had. So Chris Gould from uh, Southern Manatee Fire Rescue, he says, for us to be able to get in in just a few minutes and determine what type of hazard this is, if this is something that's going to blow up or something that's going to po poison people, it tells us which direction to take the incident. So good, important information. Let's, uh, I'm going to look at a couple other case studies. I actually had two guests planned for today that couldn't make it because one of them ended up having to deal with some kids in school, homeschool stuff and getting ready for that. And the other had to actually get deployed today. So uh, my guest didn't make it. So I do have some case studies here that we can look at real quick. Los Angeles Fire Department, they were fairly early adopters back in 2015. They've since deployed on 175 plus incident related missions. Um, this data is about a year old now. So uh, it's probably well into the, the 200 plus, 250 plus missions now. They're flying Matrice 200 series, a Matrice 600 Pro, Phantom 4 Pros, and they even bought the Spark for being able to fly into conditions that they might not want to take their bigger, more expensive units in, like hazmat conditions or flying directly into a structure, into a house to survey it before putting people in. So the Spark was actually fairly effective for that. Their uh, test shown that their XT2 equipped 200 series drone cuts their SAR mission times by 80%, and, and that's huge. Now in some of these, there's there's some links I, I, I still have on here. So I will send this PowerPoint out so that you can get to the different links that are here. If that's something you guys are interested in, I will make sure that I get that stuff out to you. And again, this will be recorded. So if you just want to play it back, you can, but I will send out the PowerPoint so you can have access to all the different links that are on here. 
uh, the Richard Field said that the information gap between helicopter pilots and our men on the ground is what led us to integrate drones into our department. Drones have provided us with real-time communication, which we can quickly share with incident commanders. So again, showing you know that they're they're when they're active and they're really using their drones for incidents that they have some data that says yes, this stuff has actually worked. It's been effective. It's cut down their search and rescue times. It's been extremely effective for their uses. And let's take a look at Linwood Fire Department. Beginning in 16, they started from a firefighter bringing their own personal drone and showing the value. And that is something I have heard over and over and over again, where someone has used their personal drone to kind of do a proof of concept or to show what they're capable of before that department was able to get the budget to buy some equipment. And now they're flying Phantom 4s, Matrice 600 Pros, and Mavic 2 Enterprise Duals. It's a good combination of products there. And their team has assisted the local police department in critical scenarios. So again, that's something that I've seen on a fairly regular basis is the fire department being the group that was able to get the drones first and they've been able to develop a good working relationship with the police department to provide that resource to them. In here in Colorado, we have Castle Rock Fire down in Castle Rock, uh, where they're located. And they were very early on. I mean, they've had UAVs since the Phantom 2, I believe. Yeah, they had a Phantom 2 with a GoPro on it. And even back then, they started a working relationship with the police department and a lot of the other departments that were, that are in the city. So I, during one big construction uh, project for a mall, every morning the police or the fire department would go out, take pictures of it, and then be able to send that to everybody to show what today's ingress, egress routes were, the status of that. So if there was an emergency, everybody was up to date on where to go, how to get in there, how to get people out, et cetera. So one department having it was great and they were able to help other departments. So uh, again, he says starting a UAS program for an agency can have its challenges. With a DJI aircraft, the flying is the easy part. Well, I think those of us who have been flying already know that flying them is the easy part, but securing funding and community support and even support from the, the city government can be the big hurdles. So if you believe in it, keep at it, find creative ways to support it and look for opportunities to show value. And I think that's a great point is you need to show the value so that you can get additional funding for it. And I'll, I'm gonna talk about more of that um, a little later. And Southern Manatee uh, Fire Rescue, they started in 2016. Again, a firefighter bringing their own personal drone to show the value, using a lot of the same equipment and uh, the same type of scenario where they started and were able to assist local fire or police department with their efforts. So when we wanna look at kind of the, the product range that people are using, more and more it's the starting off with the Mavic 2 Enterprise line. And that's the Mavic 2 Enterprise Zoom and the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. And then as you move up, the kind of the next level is the Matrice 210 with the X-T2 and Z30, obviously a much more expensive solution, but a more capable solution. And often it's a combination of those two where you have a fast deployment system with the Mavic 2 Enterprises and then your heavy lifter for more advanced search and rescue type of operations, SWAT teams and things with the M210, X-T2 and Z30. The M600 Pro really isn't used that much anymore. There are some departments around here that are still using it, mostly to fly lights. So we have these big light panels from uh, Luminol, uh, Luminaire that, uh, I mean, they can light up a football stadium with an M600 Pro. Two of these big light panels on there and you have enough light that you're gonna light up a big area. 
So they're not really using them for um, putting the, the cameras on them and doing searching with them it, to get better flight times with the other products. But if you need a heavy lift, the M600 Pro is great. Here, Douglas County Search and Rescue, they utilize their M600 Pro. They also have the lights on them, but they also have our payload drop kit so that they can drop a radio or GPS or thermal blankets, medicines, whatever they need to in order to get that to the person that they're, they're trying to rescue so that that person can last long enough for the rescue teams to get there. Now, in the past, we would see a lot of people using just the Phantom 4 because it was a great machine and it has kind of lost favor due to the Mavic 2 Enterprises being smaller, more portable, more compact and everything. And a few agencies are using the Phantom 4 RTK, which is going to provide a higher level of accuracy when it comes to mapping. Not every department is going to need high level accuracy mapping. But if you do, the P4 RTK is going to be the product to kind of go with. So that's kind of the spiel on the products. I'll touch a little bit more on the Mavic 2s in a little bit. But let's talk about building your program and some of the things to think about while you're trying to put a program together. So you need to look at the platform that you're going to be using, the payloads that are available with it. Maybe they're interchangeable, maybe they're not. It's definitely something that you need to keep in mind. The software that you're going to use, how are you going to process the data? How are you going to use that data? And are, do you need mapping software? Do you just need the, the Go app? What is that? What software might you need in order to put your program together? And then you have training. Who's gonna get training? Who's gonna do the training? You're probably going to need Part 107 licenses unless you have a, a COA. But if you're going to go the Part 107 route, you probably need to work with a company to do training on a, on a group basis or something. Uh, I normally recommend RemotePilot101.com. It's a great online training program for the Part 107. And... While I have a discount code, which reduces the price of it, if you have a group of people that need it, then please contact me and I will put you in contact with Remote Pilot 101 and they can put together a discounted program for a group of people. So definitely have that uh, piece to consider. And then your support. Who's doing the support of the product? Who's doing the support of the pilots? Who's doing the support of the aircraft? Now, some of that is us. We are a one of only three recommended DGI service centers in the country. So we have that side of the support program, but you also need to have your side for the pilots out there in the field who need technical support or assistance or have questions on how things work. So that's kind of a, a back-end piece that you definitely need to take into consideration. And then oftentimes there's uh, different levels of integration for mapping and surveying type things. Are you already using tools to do that from the ground level? And will the drone data integrate with that? Or what do you need to get the drone data to integrate with your software? And how does the whole UAV program itself integrate into your entire operation. So a couple different things to consider there. So it's kind of the same thing here, looking a little bit different. Uh, you got your drone operations with your platform payload software, training support and integration. Uh, those are the six pillars. It was basically the same slide. I don't know why I didn't take one of them out. Well, let's talk about defining your uh, SOPs. You know, standard operating procedures. When you're putting together a program, especially for an agency, you're probably going to need to write some SOPs. You're probably going to need to have operations manuals. You're probably going to have to do things, what I would say, a little more by the book, you know, so to speak. And I think some of the, the people on this call can definitely attest to that. 
that they've been through this and they kind of know what they've had to go through to get buy off from a lot of different people within the city or county that they work in. And so having some standard operating procedures are definitely going to be on the list if you work for a public agency. So mission initiation, ensure that you have a process in place to accept a request for drone data and all the detail that entails. So is it the police department asking you for an overflight or specific data that they want? What is the process to get that request in place? Your fleet logistics and maintenance, devise a method that allows your missions and flights to be scheduled with the right payloads for the job and include a process to ensure equipment is maintained and upgraded as necessary. So maintenance on these things is, is usually pretty simple besides just keeping them clean. If they're clean, they're gonna run a long time. The only moving parts are the motors and on the gimbals, we really don't see much in the way of failure rates, but on the flight motors, you are gonna go through bearings over time. And usually that's in the 400, 500 hour range that the motors need to be replaced. And that's something that you need to have part of your maintenance program is how do you check for the motors? And well, you spin the motors back and forth, make sure they don't feel gritty or too loose and replace as needed with an estimated time of whatever that's gonna be. But yeah, if you're gonna go out on a mission, how do you decide which payloads, if they're interchangeable payloads, are gonna be right for each job? So you're gonna to need to put that down. Your pilot management, what pilots are assigned to what task, how are they trained? How are they supervised? What does their retraining schedule look like? What does their recertification schedule look like? If you're doing night operations and you have a daylight waiver, you're gonna to have to have content in your waiver request that specifically talks about training for night operations. You may have to put together a test that they have to take and that's gonna to have to be included in your operations manual. So a couple little details there that you're gonna to need to document and have ready to go. Uh, where was I? Compliance management. Uh, what are your processes to ensure local airspace and flight re regulations are adhered to for every mission? And so you're going to document out, you know, either what apps you're going to use or what charts you're going to use to make sure that you're flying in appropriate airspace and whether you need to have a wide area authorization for it or can you just use Lance or what uh, the different processes are going to be to make sure you're legal. Um, so I'm going to kind of throw this out here. Um, I've got some fantastic guys who have joined, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to call you out by name here: uh, Brian Dillman, Kurt Clow. Uh, uh, man, the list goes on and on and on. But a couple of you guys uh, who I know very well, if you have some suggestions uh, that I I've missed here on the SOPs. If you want to throw that into the, the questions so I can see that and make sure I address it, that'd be great. Uh, because I know you guys have gone through this, uh, extensively. I don't know everybody that's on the attendee list here, but a couple of you guys like Kurt and Brian, if you have some extra things you want to throw in there, I would definitely appreciate it. Um, let's see mission planning. You need a pre-flight checklist, uh, flight schedule, flight plan, uh, their routes, external factors, and I'm going to add to that a pre-flight check of the equipment. Is the equipment all in good operating order? Are the props attached properly? Are the legs attached properly? Are the Did you test the motors in your hand to see if they were loose or not? And make notes of the different things that you've seen about the equipment. Um, kind of backing up a little bit to the maintenance one on number two, I forgot to add in there. You should document when you will do firmware updates and then you log when those firmware updates have taken place so that there's always a list of everything that's been going on. Uh, okay, we'll move back down here to six data collection, define and prepare your data collection methods, sensor payload and software procedures, uh, which goes along with data storage. 
your protocols for data storage. Uh, how long are you going to keep data for? Your, your, any videos that were taken, any photos that were taken? How long are you going to keep them? Where are you going to keep them? How are you going to store them? How are you going to back that up? At what point does that data get deleted? Those things are going to be different for a lot of different agencies. I see ones that have uh, very, very little data retention other than stuff that was deemed important right then. There's others that have 30, 60, 90 day, one year data retention programs. And if you're doing a lot of photos and a lot of videos on each flight, that's going to add up to a lot of data storage. So those are things to figure out for yourself what your policies are going to be. And then logging flights, you're going to need to document all your different flights, collect your operational and telemetry data to document and learn from each flight, uh, which is a great idea for uh, debriefing afterwards. What, how was the drone used? Was it successful? Was it uh, worthwhile? Was it a, a good use of equipment? What can you do to improve on that? So there's definitely a lot of things that you can add into that. Let's see here. Uh, looking here in the comments, making sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay, let's see what Kurt says. Uh, we have found that training for various uh, end user groups has been highly beneficial. This is so their expecta expectations are in alignment with what services the UAS team is able to provide. Working this out in the field during operations is not a good thing. Well, that's a great point. Um, there are different groups that you're going to work with depending on what their specific missions are and doing training that's specific for those groups before you have to go out on a mission will definitely help set expectations and show it will help show them what you're capable of doing um, i've definitely seen requests that are just not possible so whoever the different groups that you need to work with whether it's the police department or some other end group that part of the city or whoever you need to be able to set that expectation properly that's a, a great piece of advice there uh, spencer uh, another good item for sops is emergency procedures accident incident miss mishap reporting accident failures etc absolutely and while that is kind of under number eight here i whoops should have been more clear um that you should absolutely have why well, i don't know why it keeps jumping back here um you, you gotta re document what are your emergency procedures where are you going to land if something goes wrong who are you going to contact if something goes wrong uh if there's an accident incident or mishap you need to record that so that you can go back and figure it out later what went wrong how can you keep it from happening again if there was aircraft failures a prop failure motor failure electronics failure or whatever happens that needs to be documented and a lot of it is just for your own personal or you know your own agency use to keep track of it but it's also to figure out if there's a trend something that's happening on a regular basis or what exactly was the the reason for it uh and often you may need it for your agency's insurance. So just so that they know that you're on top of things and are making sure everything's going right. All right, and uh, data analytics, devise a method to process captured data into something useful. And now that can be a number of different things from just was this successful or not? What, what was the benefit here? A little cost benefit analysis or is it turning that into a map that someone can use and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit as well so i wanted to get into uh a little bit more in in depth on not just product but actually showing you kind of what it can do what the products are capable of 
and some other things to think about. Uh, one of the ones I'm going to focus on in a little bit here is the Mavic 2 Enterprise. Uh, there's two models. There's one equipped with a zoom camera that can do two times optical zoom and up to six times digital zoom. I'm not a big fan of the digital zoom, but the two times optical zoom is cool. And the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, which has both a visual camera and a dual thermal camera. So these are two that we're going to be talking about uh, again in a little bit and ones that uh, a lot of the guys out here are using. Got a couple more things people have brought up. Uh, Greg Smith the, says, the importance of pre and post flight checklists ensures uniform compliance to flight procedures. Great point. Most public safety agencies will want to operate under both ACOA and part 107, depending on the purpose of the mission. Additionally, data retention must be addressed per department SOP. So yes, the whole purpose of writing down SOPs and creating checklists is so that everybody does the same thing every time. You don't want something critical to get missed in your pre-flight and post-flight checklists. You wanna make sure that everybody knows how to do it the same way so that when it comes to reporting and logging, that the data is consistent and reliable. And yes, the um, good point about uh, if you have a COA, you're definitely going to need uh, data retention policies. Uh, let's see, Brian, he says, um, integrate UAS into the customer training program, resolve interface and expectations on the training ground, not on calls. Yep, absolutely. Um, anyone who's gonna be involved in accessing the data that you're providing or working with the data that you're providing or, or looking at the feed needs to do this in training before you go out on the field or not on a phone call trying to figure it out. You need to do a training with them. And uh, see what Dave says here. Uh, Okay, Dave says, our SOPs follow the below items, team organization, airspace authority, light crew qualifications, aircraft airworthiness and maintenance, UAS operations, UAS safety, launch and recovery, launch and landing zones, emergency and contingency procedures, Incident, accident, mishap reporting, and information management. Gosh, thank you, Dave. That was a big chunk to type in there. I really appreciate that. And that's one of the things I want to try and accomplish with some of these webinars is not just talking to new people and trying to show them what's going on, but also to get some of these guys that are out here who are in the field, who are doing this on a regular basis to help contribute and pass on some best practices so that everybody can help learn from each other. And if maybe, you know, in a little bit, we can do something where it's, it's a lot more interactive and people can share their own experiences and best practices amongst everybody. Because what I have found is you, you may have two cities that are just right next to each other and they don't know what each other is doing. They don't know how, uh, each other's working and they could really take advantage of that. So I would like to encourage not only just communication locally, but as broad as we can get. And if I can help facilitate that with some interactive uh, group video conferences or whatever to uh, help make that happen, I would love to, to help be a part of that. Uh, Ron, good point here. Uh, battery management is essential. Uh, must be part of your logs and record any problems. So yes, if we're talking about uh, our logging of our flights, this needs to, gosh, I keeps jumping back. Um, it needs to include your battery management, how many charges they have on them, when were, was there firmware that was updated on them, um, all the different maintenance that goes into batteries because battery management is a big, big deal. For someone like myself, I'm just like, uh, I might decide to go fly tonight, so I'm going to top off my batteries. Or I'm probably going to fly over the weekend. I may charge my batteries Friday afternoon. 
But for a lot of you guys, you got to keep those batteries charged all the time so that you're ready to go. And so keeping track of your rotation of your batteries that you're flying with, the, the lifetime on them, the charge cycles, that's going to be very important. Uh, making sure that that is part of your logging and your analytics. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, Section 337 of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018, signed into law on October 5th, 2018, proposes that commercial drone operators be required to have a publicly available and regularly updated written privacy policy that outlines policies regarding the collection, use, retention, dissemin dis dissemination, and deletion of any data collected during a mission. Is there any guidance for this yet? Well, that's a great question. And I think so long as you have a policy, right? you need to have a policy when it comes to data collection and data management. And it a lot of it is going to come from your city lawyer or your county lawyer, you know, whoever is running your the legal for your agency, they're going to often tell you what it is. In many cases, it's going to be similar to what they're doing with their body cams, for example. So we're, we're seeing that and the same type of data collection or data retention policies that are there. Yeah, so there should be some precedent somewhere in your city or county or state level that is already using some form of camera for something and there should be an existing policy that you can work off of. Then that's probably where I would start is try and find a policy that's already in use by a similar agency in your city or county and, and use that because it's already been accepted. It's what people understand. You don't, you're not reinventing the wheel. Okay, let's see what Greg had to say here. Uh, there are several third-party software providers that incorporate features that help UAS program managers capture everything from flight procedures, compliance, pilot flight hours, aircraft maintenance needs, hardware, firmware updates, uh, CAPS reporting, and airspace restri restriction compliance. Um, if, if you know of some software that's really good at this, uh, please put it in the comments and I'll, I'll share it. I used to use Kitty Hawk like crazy until they just changed everything and even my paid subscription went away. And um, so I don't even know if that's the best tool anymore. Air data, I've heard of some, some stuff about, but it's one of those things I've been looking at trying to um, research here again pretty soon because some of the tools that I had known in the past are no longer available. So if anyone knows of some tools to help with this logging and, and analytics, and maintenance logs um, that can give some uh, pointers there. Totally appreciate that. Uh, sir, anyone currently using Matrice 210 V2 with TB55 batteries that have recommendation on rotation, number of batteries, and discharge rate? Um, yeah, Thomas, we can try and get you some uh, information on that from other people with some best practices here. Um, really it comes down to how often are you using it i mean i know there's mountain rescue guys who are going through three four five sets of batteries a day so rotation not a big deal they start it you know they just started the next one and they just rotate them through and they keep them going there's guys that only roll out once a week or even less so they're not going to need as many batteries and but again you would continue to stick to a rotation um, on it and discharging well that's that's a tough one i mean it's this is a the one thing is is really cool about the intelligent batteries is they're safer than dumb batteries but the downside is they are going to discharge uh after about a week they'll, they'll start dropping down so it's something to watch for that would be included in your sop and your maintenance program as to how often stale batteries are are um, recharged even if they're not being used uh, 
Uh, Dave, good point here. When you're developing a public safety program, before you ever try and define an actual UAS platform, you need to define the mission and the requirements that will help de determine the platform. Couldn't agree more. Uh, the, the type of aircraft is driven by the mission objectives, not the other way around. Now, sometimes it doesn't work that way because you have a budget that doesn't allow you to get into something that might be a better choice. If you come to me and you say, we have a $6,000 budget, but I got to get something, well, then I'm going to give you the best that I can give you given that budget. But if you have the correct budget and you can clearly define your parameters, then we can help pick the right payloads for your particular mission requirements. Uh, Greg says they use Kitty Hawk. Okay, that's good. Um, but there's also a drone sense, drone deploy, and others. Um, I said, I'll, I'll try and do, find some other ones um, if I get some other recommendations as well. Kitty Hawk was always my favorite. It just worked really well. Uh, let's see, in California, we're forming regional UAS operator groups that meet and exchange information, including SOPs, use cases, best practices, provide regional interagency training opportunities. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, there's one in Sacramento, Sierra Nevada uh, region and North Bay area at present and some forming in SoCal as well. That is excellent, Greg. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. And here in Colorado, we have uh, the Center of Excellence, which tries to provide um, a good forum every year for getting information out and working with best practices. So there's, uh, it's, it's happening more and more, but I, I really like seeing these regional operator groups type things to exchange that information help provide resources to each other, um, knowing who to call when there's a problem. If your bird's down, but you gotta have one, who's the right person to call? Interagency training, that sounds like a biggie. Uh, you're gonna think of things that someone else might, so that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, oh, Sam, good question. How do I see the impact of DJI being potentially forced out of federal use? Well, that's been a tough one right now, to be honest with you. And I, I'm not really sure how this is going to play out. Uh, the problem is they want government agencies to use U.S. manufactured products. and there's really not much in the way of choices. So either we're going to see an increase in production of some US made products, and there's a couple of them that are on the, the very near horizon. So maybe that will just simply be the solution, or they'll actually figure out that there's not a security problem and just move on and get back to business as normal. So. How it's going to play out in the long run, not really sure. Uh, and Greg says he can put interest, anyone interested in a group in contact with the group leader. So those California groups, that sounds really cool. Um, you can always email me. My email address will be at the end. It's just kgarrison at multicopterwarehouse.com. I can put you guys in contact if uh, you're kind of looking to expand in that area. Uh, let's see. It appears the state of California and possibly local government will likely be following the federal ban. Yeah, we'll see. Um, hard to say right now. Uh, it's it's a whole whole other issue, um, but we'll just have to kind of see how that plays out. Okay, let's talk about training programs. And uh, we've already talked a little bit uh, going through the questions and some of the comments that were here, um, but Again, if you want to throw some stuff in there to share with everyone else about training programs, that'd be great. Um, you got to train on equipment preparation, how to get the machine ready to fly, how do you, you know, attach the different payloads, how do you make sure that the batteries are charged properly, how do you check the, the motors to make sure that they're spinning properly, that the props are attached properly. If you're flying a machine like this, like the 210, 
is it uh, all assembled properly? Is everything ready to go? Are the, are the props put on correctly? There's a, a lot to go on on just the equipment preparation. Flight controls and operation. Now, I've seen this, well, it kind of goes with the next one too, camera operation, especially in a, a two-man operation, is communication and the delegation of workload. So you got to know how the machine works and you got to know how it operates and you need to know how to operate the camera so that you're efficient and um, using the camera properly. And often I see teams that, you know, get a machine like this, which is very complicated with a thermal camera and a zoom camera, and they just go out and start trying to fly missions and they end up having a thousand questions for me when kind of the best thing to do would have been to set the damn thing on a bench and figure it out before you ever spin up the rotors. Now that way you can spend hours of time without changing batteries versus 20, 25 minutes at a time on each flight when you can accomplish the same thing, just putting it on a bench and learning how to use the camera, learn how to use the gimbals, learn what the different controls are, learn how to communicate with each other between the pilot and the camera operator. If he says, go right, what does that mean? You know, I mean, is the aircraft's right? Is it the pilot's right? Is it the camera operator's right? You know, use better forms of commun communication when you're asking the pilot to move somewhere than just like go left or right. It doesn't always work that way when cameras are capable of being spun all the way around. So there's a lot that goes into a two-man operation and getting communication and uh, control of the, the aircraft and the cameras down uh, really well. Back to the data storage and retention, you gotta have a training on that. Well, how are you pulling that cards out? What happens to that card once it comes out of the aircraft? Where does it go? Where does it get backed up? And get that all down before trying to get on your first mission. Is there specialized equipment such as, like I, I've mentioned, our payload drop kit? How does that attach? How does it work? How do you, you use that stuff? And then the maintenance side of things, you know, making sure that their sperm are upgraded, that the, the motors are working properly, all the different little maintenance aspect things that all need to be done, need to be part of that training program. All right, so let's kind of talk about what these things can do. And if you're not familiar with the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual or the Zenmuse X-T2, uh, both of those systems can record, or they will record, both a normal visible image and a thermal image and they have the ability, which is called MSX, to overlay that data together. So here we're looking at a frame and we see the daylight image and the combined thermal daylight image in the upper right hand corner. Now, if we were just looking at a thermal image, all the lines on there, all the extra detail would be gone and we'd only be looking at thermal data. But the fact that we can actually um, read that there's a there's signage, and if we got close enough to it, whoops, whoops, wrong key. If we got close enough, we could actually read that it says Mohawk on the side of that van, and we can read our logo on the building. Where normal thermal, you'd never be able to do that. So it's kind of a interesting thing. Um, Kurt. Uh, through something out here, your point of bench testing, tabletop training, and training specific to a skill that is mission related. Crawl, walk, run. You can skip this if you don't want since you're a past training section. Oh, that's the note to me. But yes, you, you need to do your bench testing, your tabletop training, and training that's specific to a skill that is mission related. And sometimes it's, you know, how do you use a thermal camera uh, if you're doing search and rescue operation that that's going to be a different type of mission than searching for a suspect that's running through the woods so uh, different mission related things that all kind of need to be taken into account so kind of back to this slide here we're looking at this combined thermal image so that we can actually see more detail 
this was shot with a Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual, okay? If we were using an X-T2, we would have better resolution um, and more detail. But I'm, I'm gonna actually play through this because there's a couple things that I wanna mention about how this stuff works. Why, why does it keep jumping slides here? Okay, so play. All right, what's going on here? Uh, something's not quite right. There we go. Okay, so now you can see me walking. I go behind the tree here. You can see the thermal and the detail there. Now, what I want you to note here that you would not see in a normal thermal image is my shadow. If we were just using a thermal camera, you wouldn't see these shadows of the person or vehicles or things. You would just see the actual thermal data. Now, this can be very, very useful in a couple different scenarios. First off, even though that person hid underneath those trees, I could still see movement because his shadow's moving. Well, if we can see shadows, the other thing we can see is light. And so that becomes very, very interesting use of this camera. And it was a technique I, I picked up from um, the guys over in Willoughby, Ohio, that they were using a Mavic 2 Enterprise to go uh, chase a suspect through the woods. And they were trying to figure out how to communicate between the drone's orientation and the feet on the ground, what their orientation was. And so what he said was, take, take your, it was in the uh, evening, so this worked really well. He said, take your flashlight and kind of shine it on the ground. Well, when they did that, he could see where that light was hitting the ground. You could see the beam of the flashlight hitting the ground. So based on that, he could say, okay, from, from that point, go to your 11 o'clock. Instead of, you know, once you're up and you've spun around a few times and everything, trying to say what left or right is, or, you know, what does 11 o'clock mean when you're the drone operator versus, okay, where you're shining that beam of light is your 12 o'clock, your suspect is at nine o'clock. That was really handy communication. So the MSX that's built into the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual and the X-T2 can be really useful in that type of scenario, trying to figure out how to communicate because you can see the light spread from the flashlight and be able to give really good directions to your feet on the ground. And uh, I always liked this piece of video where he's trying to hide under the tree, but because he was still moving, I could see the shadows there. So something you wouldn't see with just a normal thermal camera. So I found that interesting. And uh, if you guys have any other uh, good, like uh, best practices or tips for that, like I just shared, that'd be, that's fantastic as well. Okay, we'll move up to the uh, Matrice 200 V2. Definitely gonna be on the higher end of things, gonna be quite a bit more expensive than the Mavic 2 Enterprise products. Their, their biggie is interchangeable payloads. And while that may or may not be an issue for you, maybe it, maybe it is. You want a single aircraft platform that can do multiple missions. Uh, you may want a regular camera on it for doing some mapping missions. You may want the zoom camera for being able to zoom in, you know, read a license plate from a quarter mile away, or you know, a SWAT team would really benefit from the zoom camera so that they can get a close-up of the action without putting the aircraft danger close. And then the 210, the, the 200 can take a single payload at a time. And that's it, just a single front-facing payload. The 210, definitely the most purchased model out there uh, in the 200 series, can have either two front-facing cameras, like the picture shows here, it can have one on the front, one on the top, or it can have a single. So a couple different ways of configuring it. Most everyone has the two camera configuration like this. And when it comes to 
police, fire, search and rescue and stuff, they're going to have an X-T2 and a Z-30. Now, we do have some other payloads, such as a um, spotlight. So it will, the spotlight moves in conjunction with the other camera to light up the area. Um, there's a methane detector. There's um, a couple other products that are coming. Uh, we will be getting in a loudspeaker for the M210 uh, in the near future here. Uh, we're just trying to see what the, the demand is for that and how soon we can start getting some of that product in. So if you're looking for a, a really, really loud loudspeaker, then uh, we'll have a product available for the 210. And then there's the Matrice 210 RTK, really not sold to uh, public safety because it's just extremely good for precision hold and for accuracy when it comes to doing mapping. I, I do know some agencies that do mapping for the city and that's, that's great if you need that, but it's generally going to be massive overkill and you're not gonna set up the RTK for most standard public agency type of uh, applications. All right, the uh, two cameras that I talked about there were the dual sensor thermal, the X-T2 and the Z-30, I think I've mentioned those enough. The P4 RTK, again, unless you are doing mapping for either your own agency or for another agency in the city, you probably do not need to go to the Phantom 4 RTK, but fortunately we do have the Phantom 4 Pro back available again. Choosing between the Phantom 4 Pro or the Mavic 2 Pro, I personally would go with a Mavic 2 Pro just because it's light, more lightweight and it's easier to, um, to transport around. Um, I'm sorry, Paul was asking the price point. Um, so, I mean, I, I can go back and um, we can kind of buzz through these a little bit here. Um, your Mavic 2 Enterprises are in the $3,000 range, uh, depending on how you kit them out, extra batteries, car chargers, different cases, but you're going to start in right around 3000 fully kitted out with the thermal camera. You're still going to be closer to like 4000 but you're... You're well under 5,000, which is nice. When we get into the 200 series, the Matrice 200 is going to start around 7,000. The 210 is going to go up to about 10,000. The RTK is going to be about 14,000. And then your payloads, your XT2 is, uh, there's different configurations. There's 336 resolution versus 640 resolution and different lenses and things. But your, the normal camera sold for public safety is the X-T2 640, 30 hertz with either a 13 or a 19 millimeter lens. And that camera is going to be around 14,000. And the Z30 is going to be, uh, if I remember right, I may be off on this one, $29.99, uh, $3,000. So right in that neighborhood, I, I think so. I think I'm right on that. So. Hopefully that answered your question on price. Uh, Mavic 2 Pro versus Phantom 4 Pro. I'd only go with the Phantom 4 if you were doing mapping um, due to the global shutter versus the rolling shutter. Technically, it's not a global shutter. It's a mechanical shutter, so a little bit different than a global shutter, but um, close enough. And while a lot of people will harp on you have to have the mechanical shutter for doing mapping uh, missions, I personally have done more mapping missions with a Mavic 2 Pro than I have done with a Phantom 4 Pro, and they turn out perfect. And where that's going to make a bigger difference is earlier in the day and later in the day when it's not as bright out. The Mavic 2 Pro will do, <coughs> excuse me, perfectly fine in midday, bright sunny days because the shutter speed is going to be so fast that any effect of rolling shutter is pretty much non-existent. So there's something to be said for the Phantom 4 Pro, um, but 
in the right conditions. The Mavic 2 Pro, when it comes to mapping, is going to be near identical for almost all applications. So there are exceptions where the Phantom 4 Pro for mapping is a better choice. There's not really a, a big question there. Okay, let's get into, uh, I do want to mention Flight Hub. Um, this is a management tool from DJI that provides live operations back to a central location. Your flight data manages your fleets, your pilots, can help with mission planning. And I, to be honest, I, I really don't sell this product. Um, it's too expensive. I mean, it's a very expensive product for what it does. Although, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll kind of see how this goes. The other problem, especially here in Colorado, is a lot of the agencies who really thought this would be cool to use, once they realized that their pilots in the field need to have really, really, really good internet access for this to work well, they don't have that when they're up in the mountains and, and doing some of the missions that they do. And so it just wasn't a, a good product for them to look at. But if you're interested in seeing more about Flight Hub or if your agency would like a demo of it, I can get you a trial license and you can see for yourself. Is this something that would work for you? Uh, Greg says, uh, there are several California public safety agencies that have been successful in funding the higher cost M210 aircraft and cameras via Homeland Security grants. Yeah, I, I've been hearing more about that um, from a, a handful. There's a few customers that right now are waiting for those grants to come through. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, I would check out the Homeland Security grants and see if that can help you afford more. Uh, you get what you pay for, uh, I, I will say that. And while I sell a ton of the Mavic 2 Enterprise products, they're not as good as the other products. Yeah, they're smaller, they're faster, they're easier to keep in a small vehicle. There's a lot of advantages to the Mavic 2 Enterprise products, but when it comes down to your flexibility, your the different, thing, the different missions that the M200 series can do, the the zoom camera, the higher resolution thermal camera, I mean, they are much better platforms. They do cost a lot more. And if you can get a Homeland Security grant for it, all the better. Uh, let's see. Okay. So I have, uh, we have mentioned mapping a little bit and mapping is a, a valid tool for public safety. There, there's no doubt uh, when it comes to uh, disaster recovery scenarios for accident reconstruction for um, accident investigation or fire investigation there, there's a lot of good uses for mapping and if you're also working with other agencies in your city or county and they're doing large construction jobs or something and you want to map out real quick the that area so you can show everybody what's going on with the progress and things then they can be used for that as well. Uh, DJI Terra is a Windows-based kind of all-in-one software for flight planning and photogrammetry. It, it works really well. Um, I think it's a little more on the higher end for what most agencies are gonna be looking for. Uh, GS Pro is an iPad-based software for gathering the photos for photogrammetry. Uh, there's other applications out there as well, and I'll mention some of those here in a little bit. And third-party software um, that are compatible uh, there for a whole range of different uh, applications. So the only one I, I really am going to mention here more as a kind of a blurb, I guess, is going to be uh, Pix4D. And there's two products under the Pix4D that... A lot of agencies are using there's pix for well there's three products pix for d mapper is uh, i'm sorry pix there's pix for d capture uh, is the ios or android tool to plan your mission it goes and flies it it collects all the data 
and then you're kind of needing to process it from that point on. On the processing side, you have PIX4D Mapper and PIX4D React. And depending on what you, you need, one may be a better suit for the other. PIX4D Mapper is at the higher end. It can create 3D maps and uh, 3D models uh, that can be brought into different applications for analysis and things. PIX4D React was designed for emergency response and public safety. So it will not create a 3D map, but it will create a 2D map. And you're gonna run this software on a local Windows machine. It doesn't go up in the cloud. You're gonna grab your images off the aircraft, throw them into uh, a laptop or something that's in the field and process them. And on a, a decent machine, it doesn't take very long. Uh, on a fast machine, it can be minutes, but on a, you know anywhere from 15, 20 minutes or so, you can have a 2D orthomosaic map that is ready for, for data. You can do measurements and markers. So uh, this is a great tool for um, taking photos of a accident, right? You wanna clear a, an accident scene as quickly as possible and restore traffic. You can run uh, a quick mapping mission over the area and start clearing it and be processing the data while the area has already been cleared or being cleared. And now you have all your tire tracks and everything with the ability to measure them uh, very accurately. So you can really move forward quickly with decision-making processes based on the, the map data that you can get out of PIX4D React. And again, if you wanna get something like, or if you're interested in something like this, then I can help get you a trial version of PIX4D React so you can try it out yourself. Uh, very cool product. I do wanna mention Enterprise Shield. This is kind of their accidental insurance program. So you wanna make sure that you understand that any of the Enterprise products come with Enterprise Shield Basic. So there's no sharing service, that's on the extra one. You get two replacements over the course of a year. Uh, there's a small deductible. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive depending on the product. And they'll ground ship you out a replacement. If you move up into the Plus, um, which definitely has a, a hefty price to it, but it's nowhere near what it would cost to replace a single unit. You can uh, share it across multiple devices. There's an unlimited number of replacements. It's a free replacement. You crash it overnight you get a, a another one so if you really feel that your uas program is critical you can upgrade to the enterprise shield plus and be able to get that stuff back up and running very quickly now for a lot of you who uh and this this has been a biggie here that they often need to fly over uh 1600 feet because they're in the mountains and you can go from the parking lot up a trailhead and exceed that 1,640 feet above takeoff, and yet you're still only 100 feet above the ground, and you haven't got to the top of the hill to see where these people are. And so that you need your altitude unlocked, or you might need geofencing unlocked, or some of the other uh, consumer-based locking that is on the aircraft you may need to have unlocked on a permanent basis from DJI. And that's what is uh, done under the Qualified Entities Program, QEP. So you can get DJI to unlock you on a flat basis and you're just done. You submit a spreadsheet of your aircraft and boom, it's all taken care of. And you'll need to provide your COA or Part 107, God dang it, uh, or other flight authorizations. Uh, you'll have to sign their terms and conditions, an authorization letter on official entity letterhead. So me, I don't work for a public agency. I can't go to them and say, hey, can you unlock me? Because I, I may be asked to go help on a mission somewhere. They, they won't do it. But if Boulder PD sent them a, a letter or provided a letter that said, we need you to unlock Carrie so that he can fly with us as needed, then they would do that. So um, I can't ask for myself, only an official entity 
can ask for this to be done. And then you provide the flight controller serial numbers and the DJI accounts. And that's how this is taken care of. So if you're interested in this, I've uh, put a short link down here, bit.ly slash in all uppercase DJIQEP. So uh, you'll probably be working with Ken over there and he can get you set up very, very quickly. And this will work with most of the DJI products. Not all of them. I don't think it works with the Mavic Mini yet, or you know, there, there's maybe a couple others, but most of the current products and all the enterprise products you can have unlocked. Uh, let's see what Brian says here. Um, so Boulder Emergency Squad received their QEP authorization. They included letters of need from Boulder PD and um, Boulder County, um, okay, Sheriff's Office. Uh, that's great. So yeah, because uh, Boulder Emergency Rescue is kind of uh, a different type of entity, and they're not the fire department, they're not the police department, they got letters of need from the police department and the sheriff's department. So that helped uh, get their QEP program in place. So definitely something to, uh, the QEP link is coming up with a 404 error. Interesting. Let me see what's up with that. Oh, the file is missing. Gosh darn it. I just had it there. Sorry about that. Um, that was working yesterday when I did this. All right, I will have to get a new link and uh, send it out. Um, sorry about that. It was working yesterday. So, but I'll get you taken care of on that one. So if you need that, um, shoot me an email and um, I'll get you hooked up for the, the QEP program. Um, hate it when that happens. All right, some additional resources here for you to check out. Uh, DJI data security practices, uh, drones in law enforcement getting started ebook, and there's one drones and government work white paper. Uh, so you can grab those. I did check those this morning, so they were still there this morning. But if you want to, uh, like at the top of this, you should be able to like take a screenshot and grab this this frame here. And again, uh, once I get this sent out, you'll be able to get this as well. So those are good resources. There was some good information in some of those. And where'd my mouse go? Okay, the final things to consider. Uh, technology is going to evolve quickly. It continues to evolve. Things are changing all the time. So, uh, you know, you could buy something today and next month something else will be will come out and it's gonna be better. I can't tell you when that next thing is going to come out because I don't know. They don't tell me, but uh, we're always going to see new and improved product. So it's just one of those things, just like anything else with our phones or computers, the technology will continue to evolve. Uh, when possible, you know, start small, grow as your needs and skill improve. You know, if you can afford to get into something bigger, uh, like an M210, I'd still recommend trying to get a Mavic 2 Enterprise or even a Mavic Mini just for your training purposes so that you're not doing your initial flight training with $30,000 worth of product in the air. Start small and work up. <coughs> As you're putting together your program initially, uh, you know, if you haven't already got a program, you want to define very specific uses to gain community support. We're going to use this for search and rescue missions, for delivering medical supplies, for um, whatever it is that your mission goals are. You want to define those and make those clear so that when the community is, uh, you know, sometimes, I, I'll, I'll be honest, the biggest pushback you're going to get is community. If you go out and you say, hey, 
what do you guys think of us doing a drone program? You are going to get pushback like you wouldn't believe from wackos that think they're just going to be spying on them to people who I don't want you taking pictures of my daughter in the backyard. It's all, you'll get all kinds of weird stuff if you, if you say we're going to do a drone program. But if you say, hey, we're getting this equipment to do this task, it really narrows that focus down and uh, can really help with some of the detractors that are out there. And I recommend that you publicize heavily any positive results. So the guys that I have up in the mountains that are doing search and rescue missions, uh, a lot of them are working with their local newspapers and things to say, we found this guy, this is it, we used this, our drone equipment and this mission and it only took us this long to, to rescue this guy and it saved him from hypothermia or whatever those things are. If you have good positive results, you got to publicize it. It will help take some of the uh, the heat off because not everyone is going to be a fan of your drone program. So the more you can talk about how good it's working and do some outreach with positive results, that's going to really benefit you in the long run. So um, that is going to kind of wrap it up for me for right now. If you guys have questions, I'll take them. Uh, I do want to say that um, I really appreciate how many people joined today. Um, it was a little overwhelming. I didn't really expect to have uh, 60, 70 plus people. Uh, so that's really cool. We're going to do more and more webinars. If you have a suggestion for a webinar, let me know. I'll put one together. If there's other things that I can help uh, put together, I I'm happy to try and do it, especially these days where a lot of people are sitting at home and going a little stir crazy. If I can help put out some information, um, I'd be glad to. On Wednesday of this week at two o'clock also, we have a webinar on mapping and surveying. So some deeper dives into doing the mapping and surveying product or uh, process. And um, what you'll see is output from a Mavic 2 Pro because that's what I own and that's what I was using. So uh, there's that. But if you are going to make a purchase anytime soon, make sure you contact us at enterprise at multicopterwarehouse.com that you are on the webinar. We'll give you $100 credit towards any purchase of $1,000 or more. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, it's been a pleasure. A lot of you guys who have contributed to this, Kurt and Brian, Chad, and, and the rest of you who have thrown some comments out there to help clarify a few things. Super, super appreciated. Really, thank you so much. So thanks, everyone, once again. I'm Kerry with Multicopter Warehouse. Thanks for joining.